Welcome to Media and Monuments, presented by Women in Film and Video in Washington, D.C. Media and Monuments features conversations with industry professionals speaking on a range of topics of interest to screen-based media makers. Call Me Dancer is an award-winning feature documentary about a young man pursuing his dream of becoming a ballet dancer. From the chaotic streets of Mumbai, India, to Israel, the UK, and the US, the film follows Manish Chauhan over a five-year period through his struggles and triumphs. With the help of his teacher, Yahuda Moror, the charismatic Manish goes from humble beginnings to the world stage. It's a lesson for all of us when you follow your heart, your life can take a wonderful and unexpected path. I'm your host, Sandra Abrams, and in this episode, I will chat with the filmmakers behind this crowd-pleasing documentary. Director Pitt Gilmore, producer and co-director Leslie Champagne, and editor Jennifer Beeman. Welcome to Media and Monuments, and congratulations on all your success with Call Me Dancer. Thank you. Thanks so much for having Thanks us. For having us. I saw this film at the suggestion of our podcast producer, Brendan Ferry, and it's an incredible inspiration and moving because of Manish, um, the central person here. And I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit of how you met him. Um, I think, Leslie, you mentioned at the screening I saw that you knew the, his ballet teacher, Yehuda. So if you can just tell us a little bit about that and what were you thinking when you got this phone call, when he says, oh, I have two students, maybe you want to do a film. You probably went, sure, I'm going to travel to Mumbai, India for this, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, I knew his teacher because I was a professional ballet dancer. And so I knew him uh, during his career as a dancer, as well as I knew him as a teacher, and I had studied with him, and we became good friends. And I knew that he had um, eventually gone to India. He was 70 years old, and he had discovered these kids, the very, very talented kids. And it was around that time that he came to me and said, Leslie, because he knew I worked in film, he said, Leslie, will you tell this story and make this film. And at first I said, well, let me see if I can find somebody else who's better than me. And if I can't find anyone better than me, I'll, I'll think about it. And then, uh, well, there was nobody else. So um, a few people came around, uh, but uh, he said, no, I want you to do it. And the reason he wanted me to do it is because he felt that as a dancer, um, I would know their world. I'd be sensitive to it, empathic, um, understand. And that the the thing with dance films is most of the time, not all of the time, they are made by filmmakers who are not within the dance world. And so they are looking from outside in to our world. And so he thought that I would have that sensitivity and he trusted me. And so that's where it started. So you go to Mumbai, India, and you meet the two central, what initially started out to be the two central characters. Manish and Amir. So what did you think? Did you like right away say, yes, this is a film I definitely want to do? Or did it take more time after that? Actually, I said yes, very soon. Um, this is my first film that I'd ever directed. I've been a producer um, for a long time. And I had worked with Pip before and, and knew her. Um, we were all of us are from the D.C., film community. And so I needed somebody who was experienced on my side, but because it had to do with dance, I thought I'm ready. I'm ready to take the plunge. And I liked the story. And I liked when I met Manish from the first time, as well as Amir, I just thought that they were wonderful characters and coming from a very different kind of background. And um, I was ready to do it, but I needed someone on my side. And that's when I, I brought in Pip. Well, that's just it, Pip. You know, I I understand from at, at the screening I went to, you just kind of came on uh, initially as a consultant. And I'm I'm looking at your client, your clients that you have, you know, from the BBC, Discovery Channel, Hulu. So you're probably thinking, I can go, probably go back to one of my other clients. At what point did you say, wow, I need to jump in. I definitely need to be a part of this. 
I think as Leslie pointed out, she and I had worked together already. Um, so beyond just being you know friends and colleagues, I knew her sensibility and I trusted her. And when she told me about this story, I thought, wow, this is going to be something really different than anything that I've tackled before because we don't know where it's going. We have no idea. But I think that's what made it so appealing to me because normally all three of us do a lot of television documentaries where we pretty much know what the ending is and, and it's a matter of what's the best way to get there. How do we create the arc? How do we create the storylines and things like that? Whereas with, with the story of Manisha and Yehuda and Amir, we never knew. We didn't know where it was going. Um, and I love that part of it, but it made it really difficult. And I think, you know, Leslie and I remember there were times even, you know, we'd started editing and, and we were concerned about the fact that things were really going well for, for Manish. It was like, we need some conflict. <laughs> um, something's got to go wrong. Um, lo and behold, some things did go wrong um, in, his, in his actual life and in, in, on his journey. And that's what's made the film so rich is because it does have these ups and downs and these flows and bringing the three of us together and with, with, Jennifer primarily at the helm, you know, just sort of helping us to, to craft the storyline so that the audience would emotionally get on board with his journey and go along for the ride. And I think, I think that's why it feels like a feature film is because we really do bring the audience along with us. And it made for an incredibly exciting thing. So although, yeah, I initially came on as a consultant uh, five years down the road, <laughs> I was very glad that I, that I stayed involved. Well, Jennifer, um, since Pip is, is, uh, talking about you, I'm going to give you a chance here. <laughs> and, um, I did read in your bio that you got your start making documentaries, uh, with, uh, Roger and me, such an iconic documentary with Michael Moore. And I know we're here to talk about Call Me Dancer, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about that experience. And, and what did you learn um, working with him that has carried you through your career? It was a really long time ago. Now, it was really literally the first thing that I cut. I actually cut one little, little documentary about alpacas before that. But it was, this was really the first thing. I cut it with a, um, Wendy Stansler, another woman we co-edited. And she also, had also never edited a documentary before she had just she'd come from flint um with michael been working with him as uh ap for a couple of you know, however long he was shooting at that point and she said i want to edit and he said okay and so the two of us completely novice editors uh started working on this and i, I guess what i learned is um you know in, in a way similar to this there were a lot of scenes a lot of obvious scenes and those were cut pretty quickly. And they stayed, in a lot of ways, kind of the same. The big challenge was structuring it, you know, what order to put the scenes in, how to make it flow. Okay, we've got all these scenes, but when we just sort of string them all out together, it doesn't quite work. The arcs are weird and the, you know, the rhythms are off. And, and so it took a lot of playing with how that story was told. We restructured a lot. Pip mentioned that things were going too good. What's going to happen? And then a lot of things happened. A lot of you know, hardship happened for Manish. And, and at some points, it was sort of starting to seem like, and then this terrible thing happened. And then this terrible thing happened. And then this terrible thing happened. And that just kind of didn't work. So we really had to put to, to work around a, a lot with how those, uh, those scenes were not just going to feel like a, a long list of and then this and then this and then this and then this but but really flow so that the dramatic arcs unfolded in a way that felt like a good story well I thought you did an incredible job because I felt it was definitely a great balance of putting all that together but I guess in telling the story because it did unfold under over five years and um, I don't know if Leslie or Pip can speak to this but one of the things I wanted to ask, you know, how did you go and convince his family that you're going to have a camera crew following you? And then it turned out to be for five years. How did that unfold, that conversation unfold? 
Um, I think that it was that um, first Yehuda, uh, so Manish had been studying with Yehuda um, and everybody trusted Yehuda. And when Yehuda gave us the seal of approval that this film can be made, then everybody was like, okay, from the dance school to the families. And, you know, let's be real. Here comes these American filmmakers and Manisha's family has, they don't have passports. They've never left the country. Um, they don't speak English and they, um, they were just, you know, I, I think like, who were these people? Well, let's just let it happen. Um, I think they were excited to be involved. I don't think they realized what was happening. And I don't think Manish realized how long he thought this would be like a 10 minute film. And he didn't know. And, and it kept going on and on and on. Um, so he didn't, I think it would just sort of unfolded. But what I have to say is that Manish and Pip can add to it, his his parents and his family, they were so open and embraced us and so natural and just let us be there um, in their lives. Yeah, they're a very humble family. I mean, his father was a cab driver. His grandfather was a cab driver. And this was the expected, you know, we've worked really hard so then you can go to school. And, and Indian families usually expect their children to be either doctors, engineers, business people. And he suddenly decided to take a different path. And I had read that that was one of the reasons why Jay Sean who ended up being an executive producer and he had the two original songs. Uh, he could relate to this saying South Asian families who this, they don't want their children to go into the arts. I mean, did you hear any of those behind the scenes discussions, you know, anything that you can impart or add to that story? I mean, the only thing I can say is that I've heard this story repeated to me over and over again by South Asians. But I think it's also an immigrant story that every a lot of immigrants come to wherever they come to, whether it's the United States or England, Jay Sean's from England, and they want a better life for their kids. And they are here sacrificing their lives for their kids. And um, their whole focus is that. And, the, and then, the, then the kids feel a responsibility to follow what their parents want them to be. And sometimes it's not what they want to be, but they feel that responsibility to their family. So it's, I don't think it's just Indian families. I think it's a lot of families. I wanted to go back to Jay Sean, uh, the UK singer songwriter. And I just thought that was incredible that you got these two original songs because that normally doesn't happen with documentaries. And how did that all come about? Um, it was another one of our executive producers who um, I knew that I wanted to have some original songs and I wanted it to be from a South Asian artist. And he had suggested a couple people and he knew Jay Sean. And um, he he presented it to Jay Sean. And I, I listened to all of the different musicians that his name is Jitin Hingorani. And I, I, he, I listened to all of the music and I said, I like Jay Sean's music. And um, that's the one I would like to approach. And so Jitin approached him and he saw a little bit of what we had done. And he said, oh, it's well, beautifully shot. And I love this story. And he came, he said, yes, like right away. Yeah, it, that's wonderful. I wanted to ask you in shooting this, if you had any difficulty with putting your crews together, getting your visas, uh, permits, like was there any challenges or hurdles working because you do have, you have uh, India, you have Israel, uh, the United States, uh, UK, uh, three countries, you know, four countries involved here. Any issues that challenges that you could speak to in, in doing this documentary or advice you can offer to other people on this? Oh, well, I can let Pip answer some of that because she's shot all over uh, the world. And I knew that I was in good hands with her when we went to shoot. So Pip, you can answer that. <laughs> um, I think certainly lining everything up to make sure that we were doing it properly. Um, you know, you're bringing expensive equipment into the country and there's a lot of paperwork that has to be stamped and sealed and signed and all of those sorts of things. But I think one of the hardest things and, and unexpected 
uh, issues that came about, of course, was COVID. So, you know, at one point, Leslie and I were ready to go back and do another uh, shoot and COVID happened and, you know, we had the tickets and everything. It's like, nope, not going. And that, that presented enormous challenges because there was an awful lot of things that were happening in Manisha's life at that time. And that needed to be covered, but we physically couldn't get there, which meant Leslie and I, in the middle of the night, were basically remote directing. So we had to find, um, you know, camera operators who would be willing to work over there. And basically, we set up a, a system that allowed Leslie and I to watch what they were filming, and we could speak to them and, and give them commentary as they were filming, like, okay, let's get tighter on this, you know, okay, let's move off to this and things like that. But it was in the middle of the night for us. It was, it was enormously difficult to do that. But the Indian embassy also gave us journalist visas, which we got. So that helped. We also had a very good cinematographer, Neil Barrett, who was also from the DC community who worked with us and he's used to working, um, you know, as a one man band, we did have other crew who joined us, but he's very flexible. And I mean, I had what I have to say is I think that as all of us, whether it's Neil or Jennifer or Pip and that everybody um, was flexible and not, you know, we didn't have any mo that much money at all. So we did what we could on a shoestring budget and everybody just went with the flow. Well, speaking of budget, because that is a big issue with documentaries and they are very expensive. How did that, how did you start your fundraising? Uh, any advice? And especially the fact of, you know, at different points in the film, you were told, well, Amir is not going to be available anymore to be part of this project. Um, and COVID did hit. And also Manish uh, injured his shoulder. So, you know, you have to pivot at each time. And you're going, oh, and we still need more money. <laughs> so raising the money was the hardest part. And I don't think I was very successful at it. So mostly I self-funded it, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody out there who's listening. But um, I, I had no choice and I really wanted to do this. I didn't have the experience fundraising and I tried, but I... A lot of people in the community, in the DC community, people that we know, they they donated money. Um, I got a few grants, but um, not enough. So there's a huge budget deficit and we have a big budget gap. Um, but I knew that once I had started and I had the support of my husband who just said, keep going. I mean, there were many times I just thought, what, what am I doing? But um, he, my husband really encouraged me to do it and to keep going. And so I did. So my, I don't know what advice I have to people other than don't do it. <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. I think it is important to, to talk about that. I think if there are you know, people who are trying to do something like this, it was the one role that none of us really had. You know, I haven't, I've never had to fundraise before. Um, Jennifer, I, I don't know if you've ever had to, I mean, none of us sort of, it's, it's just not something that we know anything about. And, um, I think that was, that was tough, especially on Leslie, because it's, it's Leslie who, who shouldered it. And, uh, as much as, as we supported and said, you know, look, we'll deal with the payment stuff later. It's still, you know, she was carrying it and that's a, a humongous responsibility especially when you have all of these things that are going wrong and you think, oh God, you know, you're doing the right thing. And, and we, we all managed to sort of keep bolstering each other up. If, if one of us sort of started to go, oh God, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it? We'd, we'd really rally around each other to help get back on track. Um, because it is, I mean, there's, there's nothing like a film to, to discover who's going to stand beside you. And support you when you're doing something like that. It really does take a lot of people. And the other thing is that we don't have a company. We don't have a like a company behind us. We don't have an executive producer with a lot of money. 
um, we we didn't we didn't have anybody. Um, and usually in a film, there's at least something, some kind of support system, and we did not have that. But I did find that the people who were involved in this film they loved the story, and um, I I must say with hindsight now, I think about how precarious it was what we did. <laughs> Uh, because to not know what the end of the story is. And I saw um, during the editing how difficult it is. And if, if it, like I always give when I go to festivals, I give Jennifer a lot of credit. And I talk about that a lot because you can have fantastic material, but you don't know in a documentary which way to tell the story. And you can tell it in a thousand different ways. But there's a lot of pieces, and I, you know, it. I, I think that Jennifer's an amazing storyteller, and she's not just an editor; she's a producer editor. So that, um, and she also has a wonderful musical taste. I love everything that she does musically, and I am very picky musically. We must have the same taste because you never seemed picky about music to me. <laughs> so, so it seemed like I just I just picked things we both liked automatically. Somehow we have the same yeah. taste. Yeah, no, I hear it now. And I'm always, I love the music. And you chose sometimes classical music when you felt it was ready for classical or you chose hip hop music or, um, and it was always, it was always good. And, and, and music is very, very important. I mean, the other thing is I didn't scrimp. I mean, I've been producing, I mean, we've all been working in this field for a long time so we know who were the best people in dc and i think we chose the best cinematographer we chose the best online editor the best online colorist the best audio mixer you know i think that you know i wasn't when it gets to the very end i wasn't gonna um skimp on that kind of and and i've seen now that i've gone to a lot of festivals i also see how at other documentaries that they don't have the same color the, the color and the audio and the online doesn't have the same quality with jennifer i thought the way everything came together especially the scenes where he enters the indian you know uh so you think you can dance version uh here you had to put all these different things together um was there any technical issues aside from putting the story together any technical issues that you had and putting everything together well, fortunately, our, our online editor took care of all, all of those because it was a lot of different. The footage came from so many different sources, so many different cameras. I got that footage, but it was it was not very good. And it was Jeff Huey. So I have to we have to give a shout out to Jeff Huey, who was an online editor, who's this amazing editor who is still working on it. Dave Markin, who is the colorist at Henniger. And um, Dave Hurley, who was the audio mixer. We handed them a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges. Online with so many different uh, footage qualities and, and uh, cameras and uh, the color correct is the same to make it all look so like you, you, could, you can barely tell. Like it all just really it fits together from so many different sources. And that's just incredible. Um, and the audio was, um, that mix was, that was, that was rough. <laughs> uh, mostly because we, you know, the, the Leslie interviewed Manish t did like four master interviews of, of Manish over a six year period um, from when he was I don't know, 18 to 26. Um, and his his voice changed and I cut them together, you know, because <laughs> sometimes, you know, he would tell similar stories, but, but you know, four years apart. Um, and maybe it was a different mic and a different recording system, but part of the story, he said it really nicely one way and the other part of the story, he said something else really nicely. And they, you know, and, they, and, and we put them together um, and, you know, uh, Dave went above and beyond the call of duty. Yeah, he did amazing. And considering that we, because of the lack of money, we didn't have sound on everything. So sometimes the cameraman was doing the sound as well. And sometimes the camera was my cell phone. And I had some 
you know, audio mics, you know, connected to my cell phone. So we had everything from cell phone footage to, you know, a high level Venice camera. And, and we just had to have faith. We had to faith in the edit that it would all come come out in the same good and and we used whatever you know work to tell the story even if the audio wasn't quite great or it wasn't perfect or it didn't or you know it was a little bit of a rough edit or you know in the, the sound quality we were like we're gonna it's gonna dave dave's gonna make it all work um, or jeff will so. make it look good or dave will make it the like mm -hmm. i get in, in in festivals people are like oh who did your cinematography it's so beautiful and i'm like well that's that's called dave markin at henniger because he colored it and he made it look beautiful and he made it look like it's all like it was one person and and we had money mm -hmm. but that's the beauty of the online part that most people when they see a film they have no idea about that Considering all these challenges that you did have, you're doing incredibly well on the film festival circuit. And as of today, mid-November, uh, I had seen there was 11 different film festivals. You're the winner of the Audience Award. You've won a Jury Award. You've even won, uh, I think it was Excellence in Documentary Directing at the New York Indian Film Festival. And then now a company. Um, has acquired the North American theatrical rights. And that news was announced last month at the Tokyo International Film Festival. So I wanted to ask, what does this mean to your documentary? It means that it's um, that it's going to have a theatrical release. So it'll open in movie theaters starting December 15th across the United States. Um, it's, it's a limited release. So it means that it will go to more like art house theaters. And it opens in New York City at the Quad Cinema, uh, which is in the Village. So anybody who hears this, please come to the Quad. And then immediately afterwards, and so that's a week run there. And then after that, it opens in L.A., uh, December 21st through 24th for four days at some different theaters. And uh, today I heard that it'll open in Toronto at Hot Docs Cinema, also for about a week. You know, I think... If it does well in New York, then more cinemas will pick it up. But it's very challenging today because people are not going to the movies. And, um, yeah, it's hard to get people to go. We hope that the film, having this theatrical release, will give it more visibility so that it can just keep going. And does that mean, hopefully, with this visibility, it's, it gets, you know, streaming services? Yes. Yeah, we hope that, that it's it's actually... Um, in Europe, it's it was co-produced with ZDF and Arte, and they're uh, they're like the PBS in Germany and France, and they put money into it. So that was a place where we did get some money, and also not just a, the money. They gave us a stamp of approval saying that they liked the film, and um, they liked the story. So they worked with us uh, during the edit, and they will actually start. Uh, showing that there, the full 84 minutes in Germany, France, and other countries around Europe that speak German and French. Um, it will be dubbed in German and French. Um, that starts in January, and it's already actually the TV version of it has been already shown in Sweden. Hopefully, it just keeps going. Have you given any thought to any type of follow-up program uh, or follow-up um short film about Manish, you know, five years from now, what's happening with him and achieving his next goal, potentially opening a dance school. And of course, I really want to find out what's going on with um, Yehido. I, I loved him. I just thought he was um, just such a, he, he transferred. I mean, he just had an amazing arc in this documentary with, you know, he was like, all right, dancers, come on, let's get going. And then by the end of the film, there's this one scene where he's walking along the beach and, you know, when he's at the Kennedy Center and he's beaming like such, you know, a proud, um, you know, uh, mentor. So uh, what's... Oh, you're you know, talking about Yehuda. Yehuda Yehuda's, yeah. Um, Yehuda. Yehuda, yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, he's he seems like he's like, all right, everybody, he's such a tough ballet master. And then, you know, you see these scenes where he's opening up and he's becoming, you know, a brand new person. And then that scene where he's at the Kennedy Center 
Um, and he's just grinning from ear to ear. I, I just just thought he was a great character. <laughs> He, he is a good character. And I, and I also um, must give credit to Pip because I didn't know how, um, being my first film, I didn't know how to approach this. And she and I sat through and we laid out, um, and it was also during COVID that we were doing this. And we were also editing with Jen during COVID. So that was also a difficult experience, but we did it through Zoom and other things like that. I didn't know how to approach this. And she said, okay, let's like lay out every si single scene that we shot. Let's put it in a script format, not a script, but we like, and we, every scene, like, like in a script, but every scene uh, we put, what's the intent, what is the scene? What is the intention of the scene? Why we're doing it? We would put in, um, you know, excerpts from the script so that we could give this to Jennifer and say, okay, this is, you know, this is why we shot this, or this is the way we think it could go. And um, having an arc, like you said, you know, Pip was always like, okay, what's the meaning of it? What's the arc? Why are we doing this? It's not just images. There's got to be a reason why you have a scene. So she was, I always give her that credit for helping us shape it. Any thought for going back, you know, five years, 10 years from now? Never thought about it, Pip. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think um, Leslie's got some some incredible uh, plans, sort of future plans of what she wants to do, sort of not necessarily with the film, but Leslie, if, I don't know if now is good for you to talk about what you're going to do now that we've we finished Call Me Dancer. And because a lot of what you're doing, you're going to do, you wanted to do initially, but I don't want to give away the punchline. Yeah, well, so uh, the social impact stage of the film was always very important to me. Uh, in other words, the educational side of the film, that I thought that this was a very inspiring film that um, that Indians should see, um, that you can have a lot of, and for a lot of people. It, um, but I felt that people have a lot of shackles on them. Sometimes they're economic, sometimes they're parental, sometimes they're cultural. And that um, it's inspiring for kids to see a story where this kid, you know, against all odds, just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. And so um, I received a Fulbright grant uh, that I will use next year in 2024 in March to go back to India, to create educational content, to work with teachers, to dub it into different languages and sort of get it out far and wide in India into, um, you know, I think normally kids are not, are going to watch a documentary and particularly in India, they watch Bollywood films and the word documentary for them is like 1960s PBS, how, you know, we used to have educational. So they they don't have a lot of docs. Um, so maybe it's to cut it into smaller pieces and have talkbacks and things like that in curriculum. So that will definitely take me the next year to do that. Congratulations. That's phenomenal. That's incredible news, especially on the Fulbright. That, that's really wonderful and what's happening um, in the future. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. And to get the recognition from the Fulbright as well. One thing that Pip said in her bio that I read, it was said one of the reasons why she likes working on documentaries is because you don't know the ending. And Pip, you spoke to that a little bit in the beginning of our conversation. But I guess I wanted to circle back and ask each of you, and Jen, you were, you know, when you were looking at this film, putting the story together and editing, did you suddenly go, aha, that's the ending? And then, or was Leslie sitting with you? You know, what was going on there? You know, when you said, uh, you know, you had that. No, we don't want to give away the ending. No, we don't want to give away the <laughs> ending. Away no, the but, just, ending. <laughs> but just tell me, what was that process like? You know, because Pip had said, oh, this is great. We don't know the ending. Yeah. Well, the, the ending wasn't shot until very late in the process. Um, and, you know, and then there was this big plan to shoot it. And, and, and at that point, we were very, you, we had a good fine cut right up until that moment so it was we were really tracking with it with in the edit along with um Manisha's 
story. So, you know, I think it's a really, it's a very um, real story of, you know, not just a dancer, but, um, and even not just an artist, but any young person trying to do what they care about in the world and trying to make it. And Leslie was there in, you know, for all of those struggles and that heartache and the successes and the, uh, you know, big highs and big lows. And then she, and, you know, and she was, she was always there. And then this, 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 the one that happened at the end, I mean, that it, at some point you just have to stop, right? <laughs> so, you know, there were other hardship that Manish had after that and then other successes and 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 great and good things happen you know but at some point you have to stop so that was a that was a fine ending the the one that we land on and Manish uh Manish definitely uh goes on uh but it wasn't so much like you know we saw it in the footage and we like oh that'd be a great end it was more like Leslie went off to shoot the end <laughs> Leslie and Pip went right, off to while shoot we were editing end. but I mm-hmm. think in my head I even if we didn't have the ending that we did artists there is no end with an artist's life. And this is the story of a young man who wants to become an artist. So there is no end. And I didn't need in my head, I didn't need some grand, you know, finale and ending. I could, we could have done, had a different ending and it would still to me resonate because what I was trying to show was this is an artist's life. This is the struggle, but this is the joy dancers artists they do what they do because they love it and even with all the obstacles they still keep going and most people would give up and but with artists and other people too when you have a passion for something you look from the outside and you're like why did that person keep going why did and you can say numerous people you know in in in, who do i mean it could be elon musk it could be anybody who just takes a risk and says i'm just going for it and people um, like leslie champagne (laughs) (laughs) like me yeah well that was just being talking and not giving up right to (laughs) finish this film yeah but i wanted to show that that the sort of that universal story of when someone has a passion for something and it's inside, they can't stop, but they love it. So it had to have that. It had to have both sides. And I think that's what the film achieved that you see the passion for something, you see the difficulty, but you see, you know, also that, I mean, there's no explanation why, but I think that it's conveyed that someone, why someone keeps going without explaining it in words. Thank you, Leslie, Pip, and Jennifer for talking to Media and Monuments. The documentary, or we should say the award-winning documentary, is called Call Me Dancer. It's in English and Hindi. To learn more, go to, and the website is callmedancer.com. Or if you want to find us on social media, it's Call Me Dancer Movie. And you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok. Uh, We really want people to follow us, which is great if they do. Or on the website, you can see all, all the screenings that we will be having. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us, Sandra. Nice talking to you. Yeah, it was really wonderful. Thank you for listening to Media and Monuments, a service of women in film and video. Please remember to review, rate, and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. For more information about WIF, please visit our website at www.wifasinfrankvasinvictor.org.